All right, today we're doing chapter five. My voice is still not here yet, but oh well, we're close. All right, we're going to touch on just a few parts of this. We're not going to cover everything in great detail. And at the end, we'll talk about your assignment for this week. I was going to not give you an assignment, then I said, no, you'd be, you'd be bored if you didn't have an assignment. All right. So, all right, organi organizing for security. Um, years ago, uh, not that many years ago, let's say mid-90s, how big do you think security, or what was the priority of security in most organizations? Physical. Well, physical. We had physical security, but much beyond that, no. Okay. So, uh, military obviously had a lot of physical security, but who really cared about operational security as it pertains to computers and stuff like that? They didn't, because we didn't have computers at the time. I installed some of the very first computers on Tinker. Didn't come with antivirus, didn't come with firewalls. We literally just plugged them in. So, you know, it's tough. Um, now, there are a lot of things that make it change, basically, like to say the size. So, if I have a small company, I'm a small business owner, I have uh, five employees, or I have Rose State with a thousand employees, who do you think should have a better security posture or program at that point? Rose State, it's a bigger organization. Now, what if we're talking Rose State or Tinker Air Force Base? Who should have a larger security presence? Tinker. Tinker. The larger the organization, the larger the footprint, the larger you need to be, okay? Also, budget. It's so many places did not budget for security. When I ran my consulting business, it was pulling teeth sometimes to get companies to buy IT stuff. I remember Dixie Air Title Service bought e-machines. If you know anything about e-machines, they're basically garbage. If they break you, they literally give you a new one. They don't even attempt to fix them. They're the cheapest on the market. And, but that's all they had. And if something broke, they're like, oh, man, we're going to find the money for this. Um, it's like budgeting in general. Everybody does know what budgeting is, don't you? Uh, we'll use Roy as a great example. Roy had to pay property taxes, what, a month ago? Uh, no one in Roy's family had budgeted for property taxes, and they became due. So what do you think happened? All of a sudden, Roy had to scramble and find money for property taxes. Well, now he's actually budgeting for next year's property taxes. So when they come around, you'll have the money. The same thing happens for IT. A lot of organizations don't budget correctly for it. Uh, I think I already mentioned in this class, but when I was up in, uh, I think it was Colorado, somewhere, they were talking about how their organization at this one school, the first thing they do is budget for security. That comes off the top, and then they take the remainder and divvy it up. Because you can spend a little bit less on chairs, a little bit less on nearly everything, but a little bit less on security does cause issues. Now, sometimes you could hire less people, but it gets a point where you kind of need them. Okay, so the budget is a big big deal. Okay, large organizations or large complex organizations might have an entire division located or designed for security. How about DISA? Defense Information Security Administration. That's the entire organization of DISA is security. We actually went on a tour of DISA. DISA sounds like a good organization. It, it was not, and they are literally... Before long, they will be hosting all the mail for everybody. Bill Richards, those of you in Unix, he used to work there. And he'll tell you all kinds of stories. Now, does that mean it's only here at Tinker? No, this is actually all over the place. But it's an organization, deta or not detailed, um, their job is security. So kind of cool. Small organizations that might have a less or might have one. Okay? When I ran my own company, I was really the only employee. So I was the security person plus the payroll person plus the everything else person. But as you get bigger, that doesn't work out. Okay? Personnel budget for security is also a factor. Um, I was approached by someone at Tinker last week wanting to know what a CISSP should make. And I told them around here, 80, oh, sorry about that. Told them about 80000 is probably a pretty good starting salary for a CISSP. But then I actually read some uh, information on it. It's actually 120000 is a the average starting salary for a CISSP. 
So it's it's gone up. So how much money you want to put toward it really depends on who you're going to hire. Uh, are you going to hire someone with no skills? You can pay them less. Back when I very first started running my company, I charged twenty dollars an hour. So with it, was, was that a decent person, a decent pay? Yeah, it was decent. I pretty much did anything. But at that point, I had no certifications, no real experience. So 20 bucks an hour, I felt, was decent. Uh, then I started getting a lot of certifications, got multiple degrees, and I jumped up to $100 an hour. Do you think I lost any business? No, actually, I didn't. I actually gained business. Really? I gained a little. Right. They felt I knew better what I was doing. See, originally, the way I do it was I built by the hour. The area that I'm not good at is accounting. So I'd go out and I'd work for these companies intermittently for months. Then they'd go, Ken, we haven't written you a check in like six months. How much do we owe you? And I look at my documentation, which I didn't keep. So I'm like, uh, 500 bucks. Okay, they pay me. Then someone mentioned, I forget who did, they mentioned, says, you know, you really need to have them sign a contract. And it was actually one of my clients who told me this. He says, you really need to have a sign a contract because you're losing money. Because they, they were good about it. They said, we know you're out here a lot. We, you know. So what I did is I came up with an hourly rate per machine. So much for a desktop, so much for a server. And depending on what you had at that point, is that's right, you're calculating my cost at, and I charged you monthly. And I went to all my customers, all at the same time, and said, okay, here's the deal. Starting next month, we're going contract. You do not have to sign it. If you don't want to sign it, that's fine. But those who do sign it will get priority support. If you don't sign it, I will still help you as I have in the past, but it might be a while before I get to you. Everyone immediately unanimously signed it. No one had an issue whatsoever. And it, I tell you, it was a game changer for me. I went to not much to about five thousand dollars a month. So it, it really so that that whole budgeting issue is a big deal, and my customers thought felt like they were getting a better product because technically they were, rather than me going out there only when they called me and only when they needed help. Now I was being proactive. I was when they weren't busy. I was out there checking their antivirus. I would make a a concerted effort to go out and make sure the machines erupted. Rather than just fix the stuff that broke, I was doing all that background work that should have been done anyway, and they were loving it. So, making sure the backups worked, make sure the antivirus was up to make sure the window, make sure all this stuff was done, and it has no issues. So, you know, it really worked out great for them, worked out good for me, but I uh, get a little, we're going to rid of it sooner or later. Okay. Um, how about the, the bottom part? They start talking about stuff here. Computer labs. You know, the health science building, the new one over by the highway, not the one on the corner that I was temporarily in. That was health and environmental sciences. The one that says health sciences, I think it came online in 2010 maybe, something around there, 2009, 2010. It was bought with a grant. No problem. All the computers in that entire building were bought at the same time. So what do you think is happening right now? They all need to be replaced right now at the same time. So sometimes, and, and we got this new $22 million grant, and you know, we're updating the whole campus. The LRC is going to have tons of computers in it, and they were all being bought on this grant all at the same time. So what's going to happen five years after that? Again, we're going to have this. So you can see how it, it causes a real big budgeting issue. Okay. Um, offices, computer labs, because in the past people could share computers. My old office, room 131, that used to be the only computer in this building. And you go in there and use it when you needed it. And now we have computers in every room. So it does change the way things work. Testing facilities. And not we're, we're not talking like a testing center. We're talking about, uh, how about Windows updates? Do you install them or do you test them? It's kind of like the John the Ripper project. We found out it did not work perfectly on the latest version of Kali, yet it works perfectly on a prior version. So if we had fully tested it, we would have found that. So, All right, it says, organizations with more than a 1,000 devices require security management. We're talking just a couple. I mean, could you go out, 
say you got 20 machines in your entire network. Could you do an update in every all 20 machines? Sure, I could do it. I could literally go to 20 machines. But could I go to 1,000 machines? It would take a very long time. I literally would not be done with all 1,000 before I had to start all over again. So at that point, we need to have some sort of automated system, we need some security management, maybe automated antivirus, automated Windows updates, automated a lot of stuff. That way, a lot of it's done for us. Then all we got to do is worry about fixing the, the, the problems that come up. Okay, functions uh, performed by non-technology business outside of IT could be legal. Should legal be part of IT? Or, I mean, is there legal aspects to IT? Yes. Sure there is. What if we got someone on campus doing child porn? Don't you think we want to get legal involved in that? Yes. How about training? Training is another big issue. Okay. These are some of the four areas, you know. So, we got legal and training. Um, how about uh, network security administration? Definitely. Someone's got to keep up with our firewalls, keep up with all that. How about uh, risk assessment? Should someone be out there looking for the latest malware, the latest virus, the latest whatever? Sure, definitely. Someone should be looking at that. Testing. Should we be testing systems? Definitely. Can you imagine if we rolled out an update to PeopleSoft without testing it? That would suck. It was funny because uh, Virginia came to teach her as an adjunct in the fall. It pointed out such a very large issue at that time no one had seen what had happened was she started in the fall as an adjunct prior to that she was a student so as an adjunct she wanted to use the gym which is free for faculty and staff well they would put her in the system the next day she'd be gone put her in the system again the next day she would be gone well after much checking we found out that adjuncts weren't technically added to the support services on campus until their second semester. No one had ever tested that. No, because it's never been brought up. And at the same time, well, what they did is they fixed it. They made it change so they're fixed immediately. Well, it still didn't work. Then they found out if a student's name is longer than 29 characters, it crashes the system. <laughs> so, well, uh... just so happens last fall, well, they had this update script that ran to update the system. It would happen every night at midnight, but once it hit this 29-character student, it basically killed the update. So she, you know, it, even though they fixed it, it caused another issue. So could they have tested that? Probably, but can you test for everything? No. Could I, you know, we did test a lot of the John the Ripper passwords, literally lots, but did we get all of them? Obviously not. So testing is tough. How about incident response? You know, we got a new something happened this weekend, whatever. Are we going to take care of the new ransomware? Uh, that was actually on the news yesterday. Another part of government was caught by the latest ransomware. Um, does everyone here back up their data? I mean, if I was to literally go to your laptop, your laptop, your laptop, and literally smash them right now, is it? are you dead? Is the question? Dead. You're dead. Why well, you need a backup? Okay, I use something called Carbonite. I pay fifty-four dollars a year. It backs up my entire computer. Okay, not my entire computer. All my documents, all my music, all my pictures, all my stuff. I tell it. I can tell it to back up other stuff if I want. Have I ever needed it? Well, actually, I have. Uh, it, it, it's not that I lost the file, just that I needed access to a file where I, where I wasn't, when I wasn't in my computer, so I could bring it up on my phone, which made it kind of nice. Um, a client of mine, we installed a backup, I think I told you about this the other week, but we installed a backup software from uh, Core Vault at the time, and they deleted an entire year's worth of title searches, and we were able to restore it. So it's kind of important if you, you know, and Tell you, backups will never be important until you delete something that you really need, and at that point on, you'll have backups for the rest of your life. So, and there's so many free services out there right now. Microsoft's OneDrive. It's not technically a backup, but it's a synchronization service. You can sync your laptop with your desktop automatically. That I started it because when I was grading, I could grade at work. Then I get home, crap, did I already grade that? I don't know. Now I synchronize this one specific folder. So I grade here, I grade there, I grade anywhere, and it's always updated. So that's kind of the same thing. 
So, instant response, you know, how about a virus? You ever get a virus before? Yeah, I've gotten viruses before. And I still remember uh, Windows, uh, Win, Windows Fixer, whatever, 2009 it was called. And it was actually on St. Philip Neary Catholic School's principal's computer. She called me up. It was WinFixer 2009. That's what it was. <clears throat> she called me up. She said, Ken, I got a virus. So, all right, I'll come fix you. Because it's not a big deal. Not a rush. Don't, don't come right over. Just when you get a chance, get over here. I said, okay. So what does that tell me? When should I go do it? Technically, I should have done it now because this was showing random pornographic images on her screen, and she would put all the kids that are in trouble in timeout in her office. Agreed. Now, I, I'm assuming they couldn't see the screen, but still, the fact that this was happening at a Catholic school's principal's office, I'm like, why didn't you? She goes, well, it's not that big a deal. I'm like, yeah, it is. So it was, it was a bad thing. But that was one that was not able to remove. I couldn't remove that damn virus. So I ended up reformatting her machine. So it's tough. Okay, policies. You all had to write a, a policy, which I haven't looked at all of your policies yet. But policies, I really, really hate policies, but they're needed. Okay, I have a policy at my house where the children's Wi-Fi gets cut off at 8.30 p.m. Why would I do something like that? Well, maybe because they were on it all night long. So they'd be in there chatting until who knows when. So it's not a written policy, but it's a policy I enforce through software. So same kind of thing. Now, if I was going to do that here at Rose State, we probably want to have something in writing. And, okay, compliance and auditing. I'm not currently running antivirus at home right now. Is that a bad thing? Yes. I say yes, it is. But I do run a Mac. So I'm safer. I'm not perfect. I did run MacKeeper, which was actually a good antivirus, but they're kind of bridging the gap to being kind of invasive and kind of, it was one of those things that if you ever went to a website, hey, you got a virus, you need MacKeeper, well, technically you don't have a virus, they're just trying to get you to install it, so it was, it did its job, but it really wasn't great, so, and risk management, you know, um, I was out washing my solar panels this weekend with a six-foot ladder, which you can't stand on the last two steps, but technically I was standing on the very top step, which wasn't high enough so that I had to reach way up. So was that a risk? Yeah. Yes. So my risk management is I'm going to buy a bigger ladder. But <clears throat> so risk could be personal risk, could be organizational risk, could be, you know, do we have antivirus here? Do we have, you know, stuff for that? So risk management is not always on computer side, but that's what the majority of this is focusing on. Okay. We have our CISO. We're going to talk about all these people. We're going to talk about technical security. We have the perimeter security. Can't we have one person do all this stuff? If we're a small organization, exactly. Now, a large organization, I mean, come on. Policy writing at the FAA is a, very, is a, is a many person job. Okay. Policy writing in Rose State, probably not as much. Okay. So it does change. Okay. And this is a very large organization. Now we're breaking out even farther. Okay. Medium size. This is may it still be large enough to implement multi tiered approach. Maybe not. But I still think between 100 and 1,000. I mean, 100 computers is probably manageable. We got a couple hundred in this building alone. But once you get much beyond that, it gets, especially if there's an issue, that's when it's tough. Okay. It says the central authentication function often gets handed off to other people. Okay. It says medium sized organizations tend to ignore some of the functions. They actually ignore a lot of things sometimes. Um, like, um, okay, I got a small business. Do I really worry about my firewall? No, I probably buy something that has a built in firewall. Our houses, we all have routers, I'm assuming. Do you all know what's got a firewall in them? I'm learning that students, even though they have routers, don't realize they have firewalls in them. They all do now. Is there any that don't? Every single router has a firewall nowadays. But do we really do much with it? No, I'm, I'm willing to bet a large percentage of students in this program have never messed with their firewall. I mess with my firewall all the time. 
I'm always adding a new port for this, changing a port for that, you know, blocking this, figuring out ways to torment my children, that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> it's true. Okay. So now we have a smaller, you know, if we look back a couple, there was our, there's our large and our very large. Now our medium size, obviously smaller. This security technician now with the medium size, he might do a lot. He might manage the firewall and the, do the policy and do this and so on and so forth. Okay. Small organizations. It could be a single administrator. So now we have a very small something to worry about. Maybe we got a web server, but nowadays most web servers is outsourced. Most e-commerce is outsourced. Most of that stuff, even Rose State's website is outsourced. Okay. So we don't want to manage all that, so now we're even smaller. Okay. Oh, I don't think that they say it, but it could even be a part-time person, like the Myriad. You know, now it's the Cox Convention Center. I used to take care of their entire organization then they brought on the Ford Center at that time, and they kept growing and growing. And I'm like, no, dude, I can't do it anymore. I charged them 500 bucks a month is all I charged them. The way I got into that was a student used to take care of St. Philip Neri School for another company. He, the company took care of it, but really the student did all the work. The company got out of the business, so the student wanted to continue it, but he needed someone to be in charge to build them. So they, he told me about it, so I took over. Well, then that student left. So then I started doing the work, and it turns out the principal, her husband worked at the Myriad. He was one of their head guys at the Myriad. So then, then I get in on the Myriad, and it's like, I never advertised at all yet. I had a million customers, it seemed like. But uh, the Myriad was a very small organization, but a lot of places don't start off small. They start growing and growing. And I literally told them at one point, I says, no, I can't do this anymore. You are... The moment they brought on Ticketmaster and we needed to have all these VPNs set up so you could literally buy tickets in either complex, I'm like, no, no, this is way beyond me. Don't have time for this. So they finally brought on somebody else. But it was crazy stuff. Okay. It says, large organizations, the InfoSec department may be located inside IT. Okay, you could have your own CISO, maybe not. Okay. It says there's a, the bottom bullet there, the current movement to separate InfoSec from the IT division. Why would we want to remove security out of IT? Tech, think about what IT's main job is. It's to install this PC right here on the desk. It's to run the network cabling. It's to make the computer technology work. They're not normally security experts, so that's why a lot of places are moving security out of there. So it's really a good idea to do. So you guys may want easier access. That's actually a very good point. Right before I retired from Tinker, I was in the networking shop. I was put there. The captain put me there because he knew I taught this stuff. He knew he had a master's degree. So he put me there. And they didn't want me there. But I solved a lot of problems for them. I remember this one building, building 224, a testing. It was a testing thing it was. But they had a problem that the IT department could not fix. And they basically said, fine, if you're so damn smart, you go fix it. So I said, fine, let me look and see what the problem is. So I went over there, and I said, I looked at them. I'm like, they all have different subnet masks. I'm like, why are your subnet masks all different? Oh, that's not important. We put in anything we want. I'm like, let's just try putting in the correct number. So we all put in the correct number, and they're like, oh, my God, you're a genius. It's fixed. I'm like, this is, IT told us that wasn't important. I'm like, obviously it was. And then uh, it was funny because uh, I went away on vacation for a month and their printer broke. So he called IT and they said, our printer's broke. Okay. And they're like, no, no, it's Ken there. And they're like, no, he's on vacation. We'll wait. <laughs> they only waited a month for me to come back to fix your printer because they didn't want anyone else over there. But, uh, well, so I started helping a lot of people solving all these problems. And another issue was this guy, uh, he left not under the best circumstances. He wasn't. I don't know what he did, but basically he was removed from the area. I don't know if he got kicked out of the military, what happened, but well, then they kept telling me, yeah, but he's still getting into the systems. I'm like, what are you talking about? No, he's gone. You deleted his account, he's gone. 
Um, so one day they came running down into the office. All right, smarty pants. He's in the captain's computer right, or the commander's computer right now. I said, what do you mean he's in there? I bring up the audit logs and it says, Sergeant Jones, whatever his name was, I don't remember. Sergeant Jones is accessing this calendar. So I read it to him. like, what is it? What are we and they're like, yeah, right here. Sergeant Jones. Is so that's not what it says. It's the Sergeant Jones' computer is accessing it. So where's his computer? Oh, we gave it to the commander. You did change the computer name. So go into the computer description, change it from Sergeant Jones to commander. And they're like, are you serious? Because that's what it was. They hadn't changed the description. And the audit logs basically were shown the computer description to Sergeant Jones. But um, so, and then we got this kind of really pertains to this right here. We got just what you talked about. We had the IT department. See, I worked in the AWACS wing security or network administration area. But the tinker area over in building 3001 was kind of like the, really the big people in charge. We were below them. So they sent us an email that says, new policy effective immediately. All passwords must expire every 90 days. No exceptions. No, it doesn't. I mean, even if you're domain admin, password must expire. Because at that point, we just made people domain admin and the password never expired, at least in our area. And we didn't make the users domain admins, but we made us. Well, new change. Everyone's password must expire in 90 days, no exceptions. So what did I do? Back then, we're running NT4, so I'm going through the list. We're checking every single user, unchecking the box where password never expires. So I get to a user called Stacy Cameron, head person, number one person. Stacy says, Cameron's password, well, that's, she's the one who sent the letter to us. Stacy says, Cameron's password's password set to never expire. What does the letter say? No exceptions on check box. Wow. You would think I sent a nuke over there. They had a really, really, really big issue with that. And they got, my boss can do it. He's screwing with our accounts. I'm like, no, I'm enforcing the policy that you put in place. They didn't tell him that. They just said, Ken Dewey's screwing with our account. So I told the commander, and he's like, we shouldn't have done that. I'm like, the work it as a policy if it's not uniformly implemented. So basically, they took away our admin rights, which they wanted to anyway. So what was going to happen, we were going to have to call them whenever we needed something. So said, that's not a big deal. So one day, we really needed something fixed, and we had no admin rights. I called them. We got a answer, busy signal. Like, great, how are we going to fix them? I'm like, what do you mean? I've been fixing them all along. How are you doing that? He says, oh, you remember our tape drives over here? Yeah, we got a domain admin account for every single one of our tape drives that they haven't disabled. What? I said, log in as a tape drive. Who's going to care? Because they weren't even auditing those accounts at that time. So we logged in as a tape drive, do what you need to do, log back off. And you're like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. So, so basically, sometimes policies don't get implemented correctly. So it was, yeah, I made a lot of enemies, but. It was, it was funny. It was, log in as a tape drive. You can't do that. And yeah, you can. So it was pretty funny. But okay. But yeah, the, the whole separated out is a big deal. It's starting to happen. There is something called <coughs> uh, a book here at the bottom. They listed here. The Charles Crescent Woods book on security roles and responsibilities. And I actually Maybe. downloaded it for you guys. And I put it. I put it, I know I put it up on the website. Where did, didn't I put it in here? Computer Security Act. I didn't put it in here. I, I did put it up on the web, didn't I? Hold on, let me pause this just for a second. Okay, no, I did not download this book. Uh, but um, it, you can actually read excerpts of it online. But what this book is really talking about is the roles and responsibilities. There's something called best practices. So if you know an organization does something really good or if there's documentation that's really good, it's a good idea to start with that because they probably put some time into it. In his book, there's the cover of what the book looks like. That's right, I couldn't get the book. Um, it has a lot in it, and they do talk about a little bit about it in here, about what the different organizations should do. Okay. Um, visions, mission statements, you guys looked, you already looked at strategic plans, which kind of incorporated all of those. I looked at all of yours, and for the most part, you all did a really good job on there. Um, this should really tell us how to do our job, okay? If you're not including some sort of IT in there, then you got a problem, okay? NIST wrote a book, Computer Security Handbook, which I know is up there. 
SP 800-12. It's a 200 and something meg document. It's very long, I think. How do we get rid of it? There it is, this one again. Okay. Shut up, go away. Okay. I hate which version. Okay. This is the document from NISC. It's a very long, I mean, it's literally the actual document from NISC. Um, what NIST is, National Institute of Standards, they keep all this stuff. I actually saw their headquarters, and it's just amazing what they have up there. But this document, let's look, actually let's look at some of the contents here. Tells you system owners, system require this, require that, whatever. How about fraud and theft, employee sabotage, malicious hackers. This book, this was written in, where's the date? 1995. And in 1995, they're, they're thinking about some of this stuff. Who was thinking malicious code in 95? Who was thinking about hackers in 95? Threats to personal safety. I mean, we didn't have personal computers back then. So they were, I probably mentioned somewhere before, when I went to a conference in Microsoft, there was a guy there whose job was to look 10 years in the future. This is kind of what this reminds me of. We're writing this document that's going to be good for years. So... Uh, I'm not going to require you to read it, but there's lots of really good information in that document. Okay. Oops. So, yeah, in this document, they talk about roles, responsibilities, common threats, controls, risk management, and it has been updated since then. Um, but I did put the original one up there. Even talked about contingency planning. Okay. So, a really cool document. Okay. They, they mentioned a few things. So, like a policy is a program policy, issue-specific policy. That's what we worked with there. We did an issue-specific. They tell you all different areas of a good program. Does that mean you have to have every single one of these? How about awareness and training? So we have a very, very large organization. Should we have some sort of awareness and training program? Yeah, definitely. How about a medium size? I say we still need something. Now, how about if you're a small business owner with one person? Are you really going to make a training program for yourself? I mean, yeah, I would say no, but you need to look at it this way. Yeah, I would say you do not need one, but should you still think about that stuff? Yes, you should always be looking at threats and ways you can. How about auditing? You know, I ran a mail server that for many hundreds of domains, and I looked at those system logs all the time for the mail server. Yeah, and it was it's just crazy. But there becomes a point when you can't do everything. Okay? You just can't. Okay? All right. Uh, now we're going to talk about some of the roles and positions, what they do, what they administer. Okay? Some of these jobs can be in multiple areas. We have the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. Okay? He um, does a lot. <laughs> Primary responsibility for the assessment, management, and implementation of the program of security, pretty much. So does he know how to do everything? No. no. But should he know who does it or know yes. who to turn to? Yes, he should do all that kind of stuff. Okay. So there you go. There's some of the different roles that might be below him. Okay. Security managers. You got them down here in the middle. It says accountable for the day-to-day -day operation of the program. Okay. So the CISO is going to tell the security manager what to do or at least he reports to them. Now, it could be the security manager is telling the CISO what needs to be done. That happens a lot as well. Because do you really think our CISO, you know, John Primo here, knows as much that needs to be done as, as Brad Johnson, our network engineer? No. So a lot of times it's the other way around. And our CISO, you know, it, it goes back and forth, okay? Analyst, you know, it says analyze and design solutions with a specific domain. In other words, we're going to, I'm in charge of my firewall down here. I'm in charge of the camera system. I'm in charge of whatever. We have different people on campus. Like we have one guy who takes care of all the projectors on campus. Because there's lots of them. He manages all the multimedia. If I needed speakers embedded in the ceiling, I'll contact him. So that's his role or his area of X or his domain is the way they mention it. So they do change. Security technicians, now these might be the guys who actually do stuff. Now we have the guy who actually configures the firewall, actually does something, and everything should run through them. I remember years ago, we uh, started using Westlaw. Westlaw is a legal dictionary, basically. It's like a Wikipedia for the legal world. Um, it used to be hard copy. Now it's all electronic. 
and when they went to it, it they required port 8080 to be open well it wasn't open classes started tried to log in couldn't get in so basically there was a disconnect between you know these guys the one who configured the firewall and the actual faculty even though supposedly faculty were in the meetings i don't know how that worked but all right um security staffers and watch standers guy doesn't watch his watch but they watch the control systems you know when i had a a a, a, th a basically a breach in credit card systems in my my organization it's because of a piece of software that allowed a SQL injection attack which sucked but uh had they, the question was asked are you monitoring your firewall every 15 seconds how can you how can you answer that no one can watch something every, I mean even this watch standard guy they're talking about here can he monitor the intrusion text and system every 15 seconds no but I have a system on my phone right now that if someone was to disconnect the camera in my house it would notify me so you could technically say I'm monitoring my cameras at all times so a lot of this stuff can be automated okay all right consultants maybe um, it's funny uh, we had a guy miss Mitch Parsons who was really really sharp years ago he was here but uh, we weren't paying him enough so we left and then we needed some work done that he would have normally done well, we couldn't do it, so we outsourced it to the company that he went to work for. So he actually came back and did the work that he was doing anyway, now for three times the cost. So it's kind of funny. Okay. Officers and investigators maybe work with law enforcement, maybe in place of law enforcement. Okay. Help desk. Those are people that normally get the day-to-day -day work done. I need my password reset. I need this computer updated. That's what they normally do. It really does vary. I know when Virginia worked on the Boeing contract, she literally, they took every call for Boeing. Every call. She called one day, she was like, what the hell? The guy called and said, I need in the, in the, in the janitor's closet for a mop. And they literally called her, and she's like, why am I? But that's lip. The contract says they accept every call for Boeing. So then she had to find the person at Boeing who could come and open the maintenance closet. It just seems weird that they would call a help desk to get access to a maintenance closet. I don't know. It's just it's crazy. Okay. Training programs. Lots and lots of them out there. Okay. They vary widely. Um, I think we have a very poor one here. We, we do good at training students, but do we do good at training the regular workers? I don't think we do. Um, we actually had a big issue because I did all that curriculum work the other week. And our syllabuses were in very, very poor shape. And one of them, which I got to the point where I literally know, I had to go in and talk to the boss. And I'm like, this, this is unacceptable. Someone had taken a syllabus and copied off the web and pasted, like, the, uh, the ISBN number for a book and the title for the book and the author for a book. Well, it didn't even match the formatting. It looked, you know, and what's happen what happens to our really syllabuses that are on file with the school, say you're from OU or UCL. And they want to know, are we going to accept this course? We have to send them that syllabus. And I'm like, I would be ashamed to send this out because it looked like crap. Um, and I asked the question, has this person who did this been trained? And they said, yes. So it's not well enough then. They need to, come on, formatting is real basic stuff. Um, but in the security area, there's a lot that needs to be done. Okay? Can improve, you know, I got an email about an hour before class today from Terry Britton. Does anybody know who Terry Britton is? He's the prior president. Prior president. The email came from his personal email account. I don't know why my email was in his personal email account. It went for me and there's like three other people on campus it went to. And it's about how I can, you know, I knew the moment I saw it, you know it was crap. I expected it to be Viagra, but it wasn't. It was whatever, personal trainer in a pill kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about. But so, he was the president. Do you really think he was trained very well if he clicked on something? I mean, Dr. Hendricks gets viruses all the time. So, you know, training, see, and that's actually one big issue with the training programs, not just here, everywhere. You, you really think the people in charge don't require it because they're in charge. Well, a lot of times they need it because they're in charge. Because, you know, if Dr. Hendricks clicks something and gets a virus, and she sends it out to everybody below her, which is, every faculty on campus 
what are the odds are someone's going to open up an email from Dr. Hendricks? Pretty high, because she's our boss. So you think she would need training more than we would. So, it's tough, okay? Now, one era we do good on training is, like, sexual harassment. Wow, that is such a... Man, if you don't complete that sexual harassment training, you're fired. Don't you feel IT training should be the same way? But it's not. But it's not. Okay? Enable the organizations to hold employees accountable for actions. But uh, can I hold Mary responsible for opening up a virus? Now, I can hold her responsible for being, you know, sexual harassing someone very easily. But now if you look at it on the IT aspect of it, she got a virus. So can we do something to her? Because she should have known better. But you see, I don't think enforcement works the same way. Obviously, sexual harassment is such a big word or whatever, or such big words now. But, you know, I sent out this malicious email or I didn't lock my computer. Or I, it seems like they should be about equal, but they're not. Okay. All right. Uh, training programs, three elements. The security training or security education and security awareness. Okay. Awareness, it depends. If you read the right news, you probably get a lot of awareness already. Okay, training, I don't feel we do anything in that area. And I actually brought that up 2014, December, told our people we really, really need a training program in place. Now, this is 2014, December, so we're over a year away, a year ago. I said, yes, we will do that, but it's going to take some time. How much do you want to bet they haven't started at this point? But they haven't started. Security education, I think we do a good area, a good a job there. But again, we do it for students. Do we have our secretary sitting through our classes? No. Okay. Okay. Should building in-depth knowledge of design, implement, and operate security programs. So, should we really go in that depth with all people? No. It should really depend on what person it is and what their job role is. Okay. Developing skills and knowledge will be handy. I mean, typing. Uh, anyone got young kids or around young kids? You know, they can't type anymore. They really do the whole, because it's, it's texting. They really can't type. And then once in a while you see a kid and it's like, wow, you can actually type. So that, I'm mean, very, before long, I mean, I had to take typing in school. Did you all have to take typing? I take yeah. typing in college even. I learned on an actual ding, ding, you know, typewriter, ding, you know. But uh, things change, okay? Skills, knowledge, you know, improving awareness of the needs. Why is it, you know, when I worked uh, for Chapel Supply, where my son actually t works now, but they uh, had an issue with their software, wouldn't back up at night, it was their accounting software. And the main reason was 5 o'clock would hit and they would literally stop what they were doing, roll the chair back and leave. I'm literally in the middle of a purchase order, in the middle of whatever, they would literally just roll the chair back and leave. If you know anything about accounting software, they're usually open about 400 tables. No exaggeration. That's what the, I remember every night there was like 400 tables locked open. And I couldn't run a backup because tables were in use. It sucked. But, but they would literally roll their chairs back and go home. So how do you do a backup when you can't? Because So training them to you must log off your computer. But what they said, I see. Here, here's what the company said. You're on the clock until 5 o'clock. You are selling product until 5 o'clock. So the employees are like, okay, I'm selling product until 5 o'clock. You stop paying me at 5 o'clock. So who's going to pay me for the 10 to 15 minutes it takes to close everything out and get it all? You see where the, 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 the issue comes? I don't know how they ever resolved it, but something finally did happen because I was able to do, get their backups working. So, you know, awareness, that's a big issue. Okay. Different framework here, the different levels you're going to teach them, the different objectives, you know, it's just all kinds of different stuff. But look at the bottom, the impact time frame. Training, you know, intermediate, okay? Education should be long term. Awareness, maybe I want to update them weekly. I want to have a post I change weekly or monthly or something like that, okay? All right, security education. You know, we have a program here, obviously, so we don't need to cover that too much, okay? There's a lot of documents. The role of community college in cybersecurity education. That was actually one of the original documents that got us started. 
Dr. Schnoy spoke somewhere in Midwest City here, or Oklahoma City, somewhere down here from, he came here from Tulsa, said we need to increase awareness in cybersecurity education at two-year schools. Our president heard it, called me literally that weekend and says, what are you doing next week for the entire next year? So he said, we wait to school for, for a year, literally no notice, and that's how we started. And it's been going ever since, okay? It says, mapping positions to roles is a big deal. You know, everybody, when they, you know, I'm assuming for most part students, when you graduate from real estate, you all want to be penetration testers. You want to do the really sexy job of fighting vulnerabilities. And, but that's not going to happen. Very few people do that. But some do. Some do. So, <clears throat> and the positions with what actually has to be done is a big deal. Okay. And here you can see, you know, some of the different roles and what they would be in charge of. You know? And if you kind of look at the CISO, he's kind of in charge of everything, isn't he? But do you think he really knows network security in depth? No, he does not. Okay, part one says security training to help enable people to do their jobs securely. Why should you lock your computer? I mean, we had adjuncts that never fail. They forget to log off the damn computer. Drives me crazy. And a lot of times I'll try to get in remotely, and it says, so-and-so is already logged in. So I have to walk over here. There's no one logged in. Well, yeah, they just didn't log off the computer. So, okay. NIST has a, bot a bunch of resources for that. We have the Computer Security Act of 1987, which I did put up here. That's the huge. No, that's, okay, it's not that big. Okay. Um, this is another very long document. Obviously, you're going to go home and read every single word in here. Uh, but you know, it gives you something to start. And if you ever want to how to start a computer security program, that'd be a good place. What now? I was trying to read subsection Oh, yeah, no. Okay. It says, uh, two methods of doing all this stuff by your functional background, a general user, managerial user. So a technical user, you know, we, we actually had this discussion the other day. We're editing curriculum. And uh, I wanted to know, Steve wanted us to add another econ as a requirement for the cybersecurity degree, he, which is fine. But I says, why should I add another econ course when I already have personal finance, when they are not requiring any of my courses for their degree? So they want me to require an econ course, but they don't want to. And he's like, yes, they have one. They have micro apps. Is no, technically, micro apps. We it might be with a CIT prefix, but micro apps is not required for any CIT degree because we're not the base user, we're more of a technical user. Now, I can see our secretaries needing micro apps, but come on, for most students in cybersecurity, do you really need to know micro apps? I mean, come on, highlight bold, it's not that hard, or go on Google, how do I make it bold? Highlight and bold, you know, it's not that hard to do. I looked up uh, this week, and I wanted to add a watermark to something, and I always forget where that's at. So I went to Google, where do I add a watermark in Word? And it says click on the background. Oh, there it was. So pretty simple. Then also, you know, skill level, novice, no, novice, novice, intermediate, or advanced. I mean, if you were to put me, you know, I've taught intro to computers before, like once or twice. But it's, I like it because you really get the people in the very first starting out. Yeah, there's actually, you know, I was at a conference where they were talking about this. Where do you think your most seasoned people should be teaching? Should they teach the beginning classes or the advanced classes? What do you all think? So I can teach any class in CIT. Should I teach the beginning or the advanced? I've been here forever. That's what we do here. I would teach the advanced classes because we have no one else to teach the advanced classes. But look at it this way. So who are we hiring to teach the beginning? All these other people without experience, without knowledge. If I was to teach the beginning courses, maybe I could get them interested. You know, when I spoke in actually in this very room to an accounting class one day, and right in that back row, center table, I had a student, Justin Mead was there. I still remember that kid. He would always had his hoodie on with a hat on. He'd always slump down in his chair. You could tell him he hated college. You could tell him he Literally hated being here. But his parents told him to come here. Well, I was talking about cybersecurity one day because what it was, his teacher needed the day off. And I had always offered, hey, I'll come in and speak to your class. 
And he lit, his eyes lit up, and he's like, wow, this is interesting. He actually switched majors and ended up getting a bachelor's degree, and actually he's doing great things. So the point is, by having someone with more knowledge teach very beginning stuff is actually a benefit as well. Because, you know, um, we have someone who teaches micro apps, okay? Prior professor, no longer professor, but teaches in the adjunct. They teach uh, access. You all know what access is, the database? Well, I had, that teacher got sick one day, so I sat in for that teacher, and they were turning in their access projects. So if you're writing a query in Access, and I'm the teacher, and I'm going to grade your query, so what do I probably need? I need to see the query, maybe. No, no, no. They just wanted a printout of the results. So I'm like, okay, in Access, the results of a query is literally just a table. I could have manually made that table. But I, no, that's exactly how she grades all Access work, is the results. That's how she grades... Excel. In Excel, you know, the whole sum rows, sum columns, do formulas and all. No, she raise just on the results. How do you know if they're actually putting the formulas in there? You don't. So by having someone who doesn't know what they're doing teach that is kind of a bad thing, see? But again, if I was to teach all the beginning classes, then who would teach the advanced classes? So it sucks. So, you know, it's... it's I don't know a way to fix it. I really don't. Need two or three or more of me. Okay. <laughs> Technical users. Maybe we're going to go by your job. Maybe you are the firewall guy. You probably need training in firewalls. Makes sense. Maybe you're the antivirus guy. Maybe training in antivirus would be good. So really, based on your jobs, maybe you want to go to um, exchange training because you manage the email system. So really, based on what your job is. Okay. Would it hurt to send any one of these people on this list to Cisco training? No, it would not hurt at all. But would they need it? Probably not. So you'd probably be wasting your money. <coughs> I'm going to training here pretty quickly, actually. And the company, I'm actually going to five training things. Um, the company kept asking me, oh, is there anybody else in your organization that can come with you? We'll give them a discount. I'm like, no, there isn't. Because who else am I going to send to reverse engineering training? Arlene? I mean, there's really no one else to train. So, no, there isn't. So, I can't do that. So, okay. Training for general users. Okay. Maybe how to do basic stuff. Okay. Employment orientation is a good time to do basic training. And we actually do employment orientation here. When I got hired, there was no employment or orientation. Now they have one. It's clearly a two day class. <coughs> But so, and that's where we do the sexual harassment, this train, sexual harassment training, and all that. Um, we actually are required to do now, now what's called blood pathogen training. Bloodborne pathogens, which I guess if you start puking blood, I'm not supposed to touch it. I guess. I don't, but is, do you really think everybody needs that training? Yeah, literally. It's sort of a common, um, sort of a common sense kind of thing. If someone's puking up blood, you don't really need to touch the blood. Right. But, I mean, this is a very long training course we have to go through on bloodborne pathogen. Heather, you had to do that, didn't you? Yes. I had to take all the stupid... Yes. And it sucks. So, all right. Now, managerial people. Okay. Uh, maybe smaller people. More interaction. Maybe more discussion. Do they really need to know how to configure the firewall? No. But they might need to know what a firewall is. That kind of aspects of it. Do they need to know how to configure my or um, forefront or antivirus program? No. But do they need to know what an antivirus program is, what a virus is, and what not to click on? Yes. So that level. Delivery methods. The best way would be hire these million dollar people to come in, these awesome speakers to do all your training. But that's not going to happen because we all have budgets. Okay. Scheduling. We also. Uh, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but every fall, three days prior to school starting, we actually have training for three days, and two days in the spring. So that's a good time where we get a lot of training done. Okay. All right. The training staff. Who should do the training? I'm. <coughs> I'm actually going to Dallas next month or in April for training on reverse engineering. Okay. Why am I going to Dallas? Well, there's no one around here doing it. So I'm going to an organization that does provide the training, okay? Right. 
So I'm going to an external training agency. Then I'm going to take that and then build a program here around that. So hopefully if it all works well. Okay. Uh, so this can also organize and conduct in-house training. We actually have a person who does in-house training. She does a class on beginning, intermediate, and advanced Word. Same with Excel. Same with PowerPoint. She has a class on mail merge. But, you know, it's none of this is required. It's all optional. I went to class the other day on um, ProctorU, a proctoring organization we're partnering with to proctor tests for online classes, which will be coming up very soon for you guys. Sorry, it's going to happen. Got way too much cheating going on. So really it depends on who you're gonna what you're gonna do. One on one. Well now you know, I actually flew to San Jose, California for remedy training. I don't know if you ever heard of remedy. It's a very it's used on Tinker, it's used a lot. It's a help desk program basically. It's an entire system which you can design to do anything. Flew all the way out there to this training, this week long training, and I get there and the doors are closed. What the heck? So I finally get a hold of the company that was putting on there. Oh, we didn't have enough enrollment, so we canceled it. I'm, I'm literally in California. So they basically did a one-on-one, -on -one, one morning session, just answer. I knew a lot about the program. They just answered a few questions so I could get up and running on my own. So one-on-one -on -one is usually a great way to go but very expensive you could have a formal class which is again very expensive but cheaper than one-on-one -on -one. cbt's there's a problem with cbt's anyone know what the problem is what now the white pays attention they just click through it. exactly no one pays attention they just click through it um something uh y'all ever get a discount on your um insurance by doing defensive driving yes if you haven't done it you need to it's like a 10% discount on insurance for defensive driving. And it was kind of cool because I had my son, Micah, my youngest. What it was is he was at the point where he was going to get his license. And, you know, insurance is very expensive. So we did defensive driving. We put him through this online, basically web-based training. When he was done, and then he did it again, saying his name was Nick. And then he did it again, saying his name was Ken. Did it again, his name was <laughs> So three years later, it was up for renewal. Hey, Micah, you want to make 25 bucks? Do this training. Well, they changed it. You couldn't just click next, next, next. You had to wait. You couldn't click next for so many minutes until you should have read or done whatever. So he still did it, but he's like, this is killing me. Because he literally clicked next. He had to go do something, come out, click next again. It was, he couldn't just click, 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 click. But CBD, uh, first of all, a lot of people get bored really fast. They stop doing it, okay? And we got to finish this stuff up, so we're going to hurry. But there are a lot of different ways, okay? We've talked about most of this stuff already. So awareness, we're, we're just going to touch on it because we have to go on and do our stuff, uh, talk about our program. And install a sense of responsibility. Get people to want to secure their computer, okay? Keeps things light. Refrain from preaching, okay? That's why I kind of add... I hope I add some real world stuff to my lectures, try to add some jokes here and there. It makes people stay awake. They say that after 15 minutes, people stop listening anyway. Heather only listened for five minutes. Let's mention her name. Okay. So training programs, lots of them out there. Learn how to speak a language they can understand. Uh, Virginia had a colonoscopy done the other day. The doctor came and gave us the results. He used words that were 30 characters long. I have no idea what they meant. But I mean, 72 year old guy, really super smart. You could see it was oozing out of his everything that he knew exactly what he was talking about. But it's like, dude, we bring it down. Bring it down here. Like, smaller word, five letters. So, but you know, it was tough, okay? If they don't understand it, they will not be able to learn it. So, okay. Continue to train. Even once you're done training, train more. They fear penalties. What happens if you don't do this training? You're going to get in trouble. Okay. Accountability. We need to know you did it. If you don't do it. Or if you got this training and then didn't lock your computer or didn't do something, you can get in trouble for that. Okay. Here we are. Posters, videos. This is about your assignment. This pertains specifically to Ken's class in spring 2016. You are to create some sort of awareness campaign. 
either a poster, a something. I put it up here, didn't I? They're not copied in here, seriously. Yeah, it's on D2L. Um, don't anyone here? Don't anyone look where I'm going? This is top secret stuff. Uh, I thought I copied all this overhead time. I guess I didn't. Here it is. You have an assignment. Create a security awareness poster or newsletter that would be relevant to cybersecurity to your school. Post in the Dropbox. I'm hoping to see some awesome work that I could actually use. If I do actually end up using use, you'll get extra credit. Okay. So that's what I want. I want some something. If you want to do something that's other than a poster or a newsletter, that's fine. Just let me know what you're doing. Okay. Um, yeah, security newsletter. One thing you might want to have in there, you know, so this could be through email, could be printed. I would like something we could put on brochures around campus is what I'd really like to see. Uh, okay, so probably steer away from videos. Yeah, I'd probably steer away from videos. The problem is, if, I, if you gave me a video, I would have to get it out to everybody. Yeah. Okay. If you gave me a poster, I can literally post it all over campus. It's like a flyer. Or something. Right. And we really should be doing something like this monthly or quarterly or yearly at least. We should have something. Okay. Does anyone ever have a family member that does the yearly newsletter of their entire family? Yes, I have those. Yes, Bobby did this. <laughs> and then Bobby did this. Well, so, could be a newsletter. Okay, Could be a poster. Okay, Make it funny. Make it, you know, like she said, can I make it look like childish? I'm totally fine with that. Use clip art for all I care. Okay. Some sort of... Right. So, I want some sort of poster or newsletter of something about security. Okay, think before you click. And, and think about this way, remember, who are the most of the people in this building? Are they really computer literate? No. No, they're not. It depends on which floor you're talking about. Upstairs, yes. No, they're not. They can't even find the testing center. No. <laughs> I know. All right. Could have a website. We really need to get one of these too, but I can't do everything. I'm tired of it. Too much stuff. Okay. All right, uh, speakers. We have a speaker. We had Kevin Mitnick came in here back in 2003. No, 2013. No, it wasn't 2013. It came a few years ago. Kevin Mitnick came and spoke for two hours. What do you think he charged us? Nothing. Any? We had a nothing. What else? What do you think? $23,000. Plus, we had to put him on a hotel, get him a driver, and all this stuff. Yes. But I mean, because our marketing people said, hey, why don't we bring in the director of the FBI? I'm like, no, Kevin Mitnick would be better. I'm like, really? Well, yeah, trust me. If you know anything about and we literally had people come from OSU. We had all these people coming here. Wozniak spoke recently down at the Cox Center. Steve Wozniak, but it was 50 bucks to go. I'm sure all of you got 50 bucks in your pocket right now. So that's why the Kevin Mitnick was free. We, well, it wasn't free. We paid for it. Okay. All right, so there we go. So you all know what your assignment is, and that's the end of our security awareness chapter. What is this? Oh, the assignment's due next week. You got a week. It is up there already.